Okay, so this one, um, I think that one ran a little bit, a little bit ahead. This one, I'll, I'll take a little bit more time. And um, you know, I think there was a, a change from the initial um, uh, discussion, which I think involved more uh, chromo endoscopy, and I'm happy to discuss that during the question and answer period. But the fact is that you know, treatment of IBD in the face of malignancy, which was really the the the, the talk. Um, you know, for the most part, doesn't really involve colon cancer per se, but it does involve uh, several other scenarios that people tend to struggle with, and we'll go through some of those and what data are available, and just like with postoperative recurrence, how I kind of synthesize that to try to um, uh, treat patients. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at skin cancer, uh, cervical cancer, lymphoma, uh, and then what to choose in a patient with previous cancer who needs IBD treatment. And I think these are kind of the three hot button uh, areas or four hot button areas. Um, and then we can always add kind of colon cancer screening and surveillance later if you want during the question and answer. All right, so with regard to uh, skin cancer, so there's really uh, you know, two major categories as you know. And so again, I'm not, I'm not giving this lecture as a, as a dermatologist, but rather just in terms of just a, uh, an easy way of trying to uh, think about it is that there's obviously melanoma, uh, developed from the mel melanocytes uh, and it's very common uh, invasive cancer, and then basal cell cancers, uh, and then the non-melanoma skin cancers, which are divided into the basal cell cancers. Let's see if I can pull this up. So the basal cell, which is basically the, the deeper layer, it's the most common type of skin cancer in non-immunosuppressed patients. Uh, there's constant replication. You can imagine here renewal of the keratinocytes. This is an important uh, precursor. Um, it occurs in sun-exposed areas. It can go slow, but you can see here with its relationship to the basement membrane, it can easily invade. That's why it's so uh, um, catastrophic when it does occur. Uh, and then recurrence and new uh, disease is common. As opposed to squamous cell, which is the more superficial uh, layer, which is also common, but it's about 20% of skin cancers. Uh, more terminally differentiated keratinocytes occur in sun-exposed areas. Um, uh, actually, I'm less likely to invade than the um, uh, basal cell. So here's a clinical scenario, um, and this is a, a real patient, a 50-year-old male with a 30-year history of small bowel Crohn's with one prior resection, is currently on uh, 6-MP and an anti-TNF, um, you know, seems reasonably controlled. Colonoscopy has a few scattered aphthous ulcers at the neoterminal ileum. It's called it kind of an I1, so we're not really going to make much in terms of intervention. And then two years ago, was diagnosed with a non-melanoma skin cancer, and two weeks ago, uh, so a basal cell. And now two weeks ago was diagnosed with a squamous cell cancer. And so for all of these, I'm going to ask, number one is, which is practical, it's what patients ask, you know, did my therapy increase my, you know, cause my cancer? The second one is, what should I do with that therapy? And number three, uh, we'll just kind of talk uh, healthcare maintenance, even though it might have been covered earlier today, any way to prevent this type of cancer. And so now we're going to focus on skin cancers. So no, non-melanoma skin cancers are increased incidence in the immunosuppressed. Um, so uh, in transplant patients, uh, you see that there's about a 65 to 250 times increase in the squamous cell and about a 10 times increase in the basal cell. And so if you remember that in immunosuppressed, it's typically reversed. So squamous cell is more common than basal cell in the immunosuppressed uh, population. And it increases uh, the severity uh, and possibly through uh, HPV and through 6-TGN-induced mutagenesis. So this is one of these things where, and we'll go through some of this, is that antimetabolites uh, such as 6-MP or azathioprine have a very unique um, uh, feature in that the metabolite, the 6-TGN, is found in the skin, and it very uniquely absorbs uh, UV radiation. And so that, as a result, because there is that in the skin, it does cause local destruction, and it's thought, that's thought to be one of the reasons why there's an increase in squamous cell cancers in patients on azathioprine and 6-MP, and the other one is mediated through uh, HPV. So I'll just give you kind of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the few, the few da data, but I'll just kind of give a summary. So the question is, uh, the patient says, you know, does my thiopurine, does it increase my risk of skin cancer? or the patient that's starting at de novo. 
And so there's been two, uh, a couple of studies looking at non-melanoma skin cancer on the left and melanoma on the right. And so what you can see that for non-melanoma skin cancer, both for the biologic reasons that I discussed and based on the data, there does seem to be an important association. Now, for non-melanoma skin cancer, there seems to be no effect. And I would say that based on the biology and what I describe, this is kind of an, uh, a tidy story. Uh, and in the absence of, of more data you know, coming out, this does seem to be um, what, I, what I counsel patients on. Now, what about anti-TNFs? And here, there's not, the data are not as clear. So if we look at non-melanoma skin cancers, we look at the uh, two studies. One was negative. The other one did show uh, an important increased risk, but it did not uh, cross zero. The fact is that it's probably not uh, related in some way. Now, again, you might say, well, how do you actually come to that conclusion? Why do you say for melanoma it's probably yes? when the data don't really seem that much different. Well, I mean, the difference here is that the long study was, uh, although not a, a big difference, it was uh, a positive study. And the fact is that there is probably some biologic reason that melanoma does impact um, immune surveillance. But again, these are, these are big probabilities. These are big maybes. So the data are not definitive. But uh, in terms of how count, I counsel patients and what things I'm looking for, on the anti-TNF, I'm thinking more melanoma and not as much non-melanoma skin cancer with the anti-TNFs. Another question is, does the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer go away after stopping the thiopurine? And so what you see on the left is a study comparing current users versus past. And it does seem that if you were a current user of a thiopurine, your, your risk was increased. But if you were a past user, there was not an important increase. Now, you look at the uh, study on the right, uh, it's not as clear cut, but there does seem to be some type of dose effect. So I think what you can take from this is that there is probably um, a reduction, kind of the, the lower the dose or the further you are away from that exposure, uh, it does go away. But remember, if we're really talking about the thiopurines causing that mutagenesis in the skin, there may already be damage already in there. The thing is that there may not be an ongoing damage. So there may be some ability for the skin to repair, uh, but it's unclear how much time must elapse. So uh, I don't really change any recommendations. If somebody's been on a thiopurine, they probably still should be, um, their skin they should be surveyed for non-melanoma skin cancer with a dermatologist. Now, does combination therapy increase the risk of non-melanoma skin cancer? This was actually taken from a clinical trial looking at uh, uh, monotherapy anti-TNF versus combination therapy. And again, the answer is probably yes, uh, but it's probably the likely effect of the thiopurine. All right, so in terms of managing risk for primary prevention, uh, the fact is if you look at the data, it's quite poor, but um, most people do agree that sun protection, clothing, sunscreen with an SPF of greater than 30 is critical. So primary prevention is preventing that cancer from occurring in the first place. Uh, in this case, secondary prevention, so the patient already has the skin cancer. The U.S. Preventative Task Force really shows no evidence that screening by a PCP or self-examination reduced morbidity or mortality. That doesn't mean that screening is not a good idea. It just means it should be done by qualified people, not the gastroenterologist, not the primary care doctor, not the patient. Um, and the fact is that there's no IBD-specific guidelines. So many of the things that you're reading are really based on people who have an interest in the, in the area trying to come up with certain guidelines. So just to summarize, is skin cancer risk increased by therapy? Thiopurines, yes for non-melanoma skin cancer, melanoma, no. For anti-TNF, probably not for the non-melanoma skin cancer, probably yes for the melanoma, so a skip. Combo therapy does increase non-melanoma skin cancer over biologic monotherapy. Stopping thiopurine probably reduces that non-melanoma skin cancer risk. Uh, does the risk of continuing therapy outweigh the benefits? So what to do on this patient who's actually on combination therapy and has a basal cell and a squamous scale? So again, you can individualize, but what I typically do is stop the thiopurine. Uh, any way to prevent the skin cancer is just some protection is about as good as we can do. Uh, and then yearly screening by a dermatologist in high-risk individuals on immunosuppression. So again, really targeting the the thiopurine uh, patients, but not ignoring the anti-TNF patients as well. So moving on to cervical neoplasia. So again, this is one where uh, we see frequently that somebody either has an abnormal pap smear or a history of abnormal pap smear. And I will say that this is a rather challenging area to study because although we do know that HPV is a likely uh, causal risk factor, uh, 
uh, the sickest women are on immunosuppressive medications, and they may not actually be engaging in high-risk factors for HPV or getting pap smears. And most studies lack HPV status. And the reason why I give that preamble is that if we're really looking for the, the literature to give us a slam-dunk answer, it's a little bit all over the map, and we'll go through some of that. So the clinical scenario here for you to consider is a 23-year-old female who has ileocolic Crohn's disease, has been on anti-TNS for three years for steroid dependency, now in remission, you did a great job, yay, comes now for routine follow-up and reports abnormal pap smear in the past, but the last one was quote-unquote normal. So are you really going to change anything you're doing for this patient after getting her you know, so well clinically after being uh, sick previously? And again, the same questions as before. Um, and we'll add here that if the patient should get the HPV uh, vaccine, and should there be more frequent monitoring in this patient. So what, what, what do we know? So is the risk increased in IBD? And this is what I was telling you before, that the data are really all over mixed. If you look at the non-population-based at, at non studies, um, what you see here is that uh, in one study, abnormal pap smears in IBD patients was 18% versus 5% in non-IBD patients. Uh, in another study, again, a very positive uh, uh, study suggesting that IBD patients have higher rates of abnormal pap smears. But in population studies, there hasn't really been any association, including ones that were done here at, uh, locally at Kaiser. So we don't really uh, know the answer to this question for the reasons I discussed. The real, the real study hasn't been done yet. But now, do IBD medications increase the risk? Well, again, if you have kind of mixed studies that you look at medication, it's going to be a mixed answer. But we can see kind of going back at least 20, 30 years that um, there was a study showing that there was an increased risk of invasive cervical cancer among IBD patients treated with azathioprine. Uh, the study here from Kaiser didn't show an increased risk in abnormal pap smears, um, although um, uh, in IBD patients, but if you were on a steroid or a thiopurine, it was increased. So meaning that a non -I an IBD patient without a steroid or a thiopurine had the same rate as a background population, but immunocompromised or immunosuppressed you were. Uh, a study from Canada showed more abnormal pap smears in patients who are on steroids and thiopurines. Uh, and then another British study showed no significant um, uh, relationship with thiopurine. So the fact is that, you know, based on what we know from lupus, from a transplant, the fact is that immunosuppression and more immunosuppression probably does increase the risk of abnormal uh, pap smears. You know, obviously, if you are HPV positive. So now... How do you manage that risk? So how are we going to uh, deal with it? So again, primary prevention, HPV vaccine. So again, this is not a uh, lecture on whether vaccines are good or bad. It's really just simply a discussion on the HPV vaccine. So it's three shots over six months. It's an important to know that it's not a live virus uh, vaccine. Uh, and there are a couple of types. Uh, one is the uh, Cervarix, which uh, basically has uh, two strains of HPV versus the Gardasil that has four strains. Uh, and the key thing is that, um, uh, that HPV 16 and 18 cause about 70% of cervical cancers, but 6 and 11, looking at the Gardasil, uh, causes about 90% of genital warts. So Gardasil protects against warts and is also available for males. So if you're trying to, again, often this is done through the primary care, but just in terms of making recommendations or counseling patients, this is something I, I think is quite interesting. So now, what do we know for the CDC guidelines? So it recommends that all preteens and boys, uh, and that means uh, men and women with immunocompromised immune systems through age 26, if they didn't get fully vaccinated with the, when they were younger. So in other words, saying that if patients on immunosuppression, they're uh, up to age 26, they didn't get vaccinated when they were younger, that would be an appropriate person to get uh, uh, HPV vaccine. Um, and, but the fact is that if somebody already has HPV, the vaccination has no effect on existing infection, and that's something important to know and to tell patients about. Even then, the CDC still recommends, because remember that um, some of these may protect against strains that they may not have, including strains against genital warts. Now, secondary prevention, which would be more relevant for this patient, which is, you know, you already had an abnormal pap smear, or, um, you know, how often should you do it? Um, the fact is that if we look for, you know, guide society guidelines from uh, the ACOG, there's really no IBD-specific guidelines. It just simply says more frequent intervals for additional risk factors for abnormal pap smears, such as immunosuppression. The interval is not specifically defined. Uh, 
Uh, only renal transplant and HIV are the only diseases that are specifically defined. So again, this is something that usually is dealt with, with through the gynecologist, but just to know as you're seeing patients to make sure that they're up to date for the screening. They probably should be doing it more frequently. You know, their whole world has moved towards less uh, HPV screening. These are patients that probably do need yearly. So again, the same questions, cervical neoplasia increased by therapy. It's reasonable to assume that HPV-infected women on thiopurines or TNF have an increased risk of abnormal pap smears. Should her therapy be altered in this case? Um, I would actually say no, but sometimes you do need to hold therapy depending on the degree of cerv cervical abnormality until it's definitively addressed. So sometimes we may hold it for a short period of time or try to time it if there's going to be some type of cone or other more definitive procedure. Should she get the HPV vaccine? In her case, even though she's had the abnormal pap smear, we'll say yes to prevent the strains that she hasn't, uh, may not have uh, been exposed to. And should she have more frequent pap smears? The answer is yes. Uh, even though her last uh, pap smear was normal, um, we'll just say you kind of need it more frequently than, than somebody who is not on immunosuppression, and we'll, have, and we'll make those recommendations to the gynecologist. All right, so moving on to lymphomas, okay? And, you know, if you kind of remember back in terms of lymphoma, um, there's the uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, kind of defined by the Reed-Sternberg cell. You know, lymphoma is really malignant tumor of lymphoid tissue versus non-Hodgkin's, which is really a heterogeneous group of 60 or more uh, types of tumors. And these are basically tumors of lymphocytes, so the B cells, the T cells, and the natural killer cells. And again, just to remember that, you know, when you're seeing a patient, we often think about, you know, lymphoma. But again, you know, trying to make it actionable, thinking about, you know, what are we really looking for when we're screening a patient, when we're talking to a patient, when we're doing a physical exam? Uh, remember that there is nodal uh, lymphoma. So that may be either based on exam or the patient will tell you. Uh, there's lymphadenopathy. Um, and this is where we get the kind of the B symptoms that come into place. So the fevers, the night sweats, the weight loss, typically elevated LDH and uric acid. And then there's a variety of extranodal uh, lymphoma. And that's important because only about 10 to 35% 10 to 35 percent of patients will present only with an extranodal lymphoma. And what that means is that uh, the other lymphoid organs may be involved. So for example, there may be splenomegaly, or there may be bone marrow involvement, and you'll de deal with cytopenias. Uh, there could be CNS involvement. Again, not as common, but as you're screening patients, this is something that I found it to be helpful. Um, you know, instead of just thinking about lymphoma, you know, maybe just trying to uh, you know, create kind of a checklist when we're screening patients on the actual exam uh, at every uh, well visit. So the question is, is lymphoma risk increase in IBD? And I think, you know, it's been looked at for now decades. And the answer is yes. For non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, remember that heterogeneous lymphoma, not for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you can see there's about a two-plus-fold increased risk. Now, remember that in counseling patients about lymphoma, and again, this is not really, you know, dealing with it and dealing with, about IBD treatment in the face of malignancy, but I'm taking advantage of just reminding you that when, you know, we have this monster in the room lymphoma, it's critical to know age is, is important when discussing lymphoma. So if you look at the impact of age, the incidence in the United States, overall it's about 23 per 100,000. If that number doesn't mean anything, I think just look at the relative. So 20 to 24, 2.4 for 100,000. 60 to 64, 46.3 uh, per 100,000. 80 to 84, 119 per uh, 110,000. So if you're telling somebody who is basically 30 years of age, or let's say 24 years of age, that your lymphoma risk is fourfold greater uh, than the general population, what you're really talking about is you know, much less than the 80 to 84-year-old. And again, I don't think 80 to 84-year-olds are always worried about their lymphoma. So again, this is important. Nobody wants a lymphoma. But again, this is important in trying to put lymphoma into a um, in perspective. So now I'll challenge you, hopefully, with this case. A 28-year-old female with small bowel Crohn's has been managed with azathioprine for the past eight years, now develops abdominal pain and dysuria. A CT scan demonstrates new inflammation of the jejunum that is abutting the bladder and pulmonary nodules. She ends up going to surgery. We won't just say she goes to surgery. She's found to have a B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay. So now, how would you manage, so she's going to get treated, how would you manage her Crohn's disease during her therapy for NHL? Again, not common, but this happens enough in someone's career that we're just like, oh yeah, how, what are people doing? What is the prognosis of IBD during and following chemotherapy? 
And then how would you manage her disease if she has a relapse after completing chemotherapy? And well, you know, you can kind of think if not lymphoma, you can think about melanoma or other cancers that I'm sure if I had you raise your hand, you may have had to uh, address. So the treatment of lymphoma, and again, I'm not an oncologist, but that um, if it is thought to be an EBV-related lymphoma, and this you can discuss with the oncologist, often the safest thing to do is just go ahead and reduce the amount of immunosuppression, meaning your IBD treatment. Um, rituximab monotherapy for treatment is effective, but has a high uh, relapse rate. But essentially, from our perspective, we're going to probably try to minimize the immunosuppression. And there's very few studies, but in this study, looking at the uh, course of Crohn's disease uh, following treatment of lymphoma, so this is only nine patients, and seven of the patients received chemotherapy. Um, and then what you see is that, um, uh, that uh, if we kind of move to the rituximab or no treatment group, um, is you see that uh, a lot of the patients do uh, end up relapsing. But interestingly enough, during the treatment itself, and you can imagine why this may be, I mean, you know, people are on chemo essentially, very few uh, relapse. And that most of them actually go into remission. And this is something that I've seen also in patients I've treated with melanoma is that during their active treatment, the thing that we're most concerned about, the fact is because of the chemo, because of the leukopenia, relative leukopenia, the, the, the IBD it tends to be relatively quiescent. The issue is once they are uh, recuperated, uh, then how to manage the IBD. All right, so in this case, um, managing the Crohn's during therapy, I would stop you know, immunosuppression or minimize it if possible, uh, and then essentially just treat antibiotics, prednisone, budesonide, you know, you know pretend like you're in 1973, uh, you know, just treat with an antibiotics and prednisone, uh, and then discuss with the oncologist any need to uh, go up on therapy. And then the prognosis is, tends to be pretty favorable, uh, particularly if you're receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy. And, and even talking with our oncologists, you know, we tend to hem and haw more, and they just simply say, hey, look, if the patient develops a new lymphoma, we'll just treat it. You know, I think it all depends really on your perspective. But often they tell us to just really, if somebody is flaring, just treat the IBD, and if they develop a lymphoma or recurrence, we'll take care of it. So in terms of managing risk for lymphoma, there's really no primary or secondary prevention guidelines. There's really no reliable method of reducing risk or detecting lymphoma early. Um, some people want to maybe uh, scream for EBV, but that's really not helpful because if anything, if you're, you have to kind of think through it, and I'm like, well, what would happen if I knew if somebody was EBV positive? Does that mean I'm not going to treat them with a thiopurine and I'm not going to treat them with an anti-TNF? Uh, remember that, you know, by young adults, more than 70% of patients have already been exposed to EBV. So I think with our modern, with our current toolbox, uh, that doesn't really seem to be a, an effective strategy in terms of deciding who you're going to treat with uh, anti-TNF or an immunomodulator. What I do or try to do, again, it's always challenging in the, the hustle and bustle of an office visit, but particularly if it's kind of a well check, is to try to screen for symptoms at each visit based on the potential sites of, of involvement. And just remember, there's nodal and extranodal. So nodal, palpable lymph node, ask for B symptoms, night sweats, fevers, weight loss. Uh, remember, 70% of non-Hodgkin's has peripheral lymphadenopathy and 40% has some type of B symptom. For extranodal disease, you're looking for involvement of the liver, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, bone marrow involvement, cytopenia, or other GI symptoms. You can have kind of a bulky uh, small bowel Crohn's, which kind of mimics um, a, recur a flare. Uh, like I said, the small bowel lymphomas are bulky, uh, but that's not exclusively the type of lymphoma that occurs in Crohn's disease. And then just try to minimize combo therapy or long-term combo therapy in the patients that you don't think are going to benefit. So often with certain algorithms, we just simply say combo for everybody, or, you know, we don't do it for young men. Really, I would say if somebody is sick and they, you feel like they deserve combo therapy, treat with combo therapy, and then if you really got them all better, you can really address it in six months and see, and see if, they are, um, if they need to continue on combination therapy or not. But the goal here is really treat the disease first. Uh, and then we'll th think about the lymphoma. All right, so the final thing is what to do really in patients with previous cancer who need IBD tra treatment. And again, I say this, there's no evidence-based recommendations. Not to say that we, don't, that we don't do anything, but simply to say that, you know, don't worry that you're missing a guideline or looking it up. There's really no evidence-based recommendations. So uh, in this uh, paper, which I thought was actually quite uh, interesting and helpful, uh, what they recommended is uh, looking at the risk of recurrence 
based on the cancer. So in other words, when you're trying to figure out if you're going to start somebody on anti-TNF or an immunomodulator, figure out, okay, is their cancer a high, or low ri high, high medium, or low risk for recurrence? Low risk cancers would be, for example, kidneys, lymphomas, testicles, cervix, or thyroid. So that might be somebody that you would probably just go ahead and treat the way you would have normally treated as if they didn't have a cancer. Uh, intermediate, such as breast, uterus, colon, and prostate. Uh, again, when we're thinking really about kind of micrometastatic disease uh, and high risk, such as bladder sarcoma, melanoma, and skin cancers, those are ones really that you're going to be working with your oncologist. And the reality is that most of the time they'll say treat the IBD if it's bad enough. If it's mild, I'll usually try to get away with as long as I can, maybe Entecord or, or um, you know, low dose of steroids. So what I do try to do is try to avoid the use of thiopurine and biologics during the treatment of invasive cancer. And the fact is that that often becomes a moot point because patients typically don't, uh, their, their disease tends to go into remission during their, their chemo. And then after treatment is completed, and again, this might be more superstition than not, but I agree with this, is to try to avoid therapy if possible for the first two years um, in the low-risk cancer and avoid for the first five years in intermediate or high-risk cancers. But again, at the end of the day, if you have to treat, this is something that you'll talk about with the oncologist, with the patient, and you just may be forced to treat. Um, so kind of getting into some specifics for HPV-associated abnormalities, um, no change is needed, um, just close monitoring. Um, for recurrence, uh, cervical dysplasia that's been treated, the preference is to use anti-TNF over thiopurines, just because thiopurines probably do increase the risk of HPV and viral disease. If you have a basal cell or squamous cell in a young patient that's been treated, meaning that the cancer has been treated surgically, uh, anti-TNF is preferred over thiopurine. If you have an EBV-related lymphoma that's been treated, again, the thought is to use either an anti-TNF or methotrexate over thiopurine. All right, so with that, um, just a couple minutes over, but uh, I wanted to, to cover what I think is an important topic, and I uh, thank everybody for your time. Thank you.